Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. On this What's in a Name edition of Main Street, Wyoming, we'll dive into three more unique Wyoming towns. First, we'll learn about Thermopolis and its world-renowned hot springs. Next, we'll explore some of Glenrock's fascinating and influential history. Finally, we'll visit Sundance. We'll learn about the Native American ritual of the Sundance, and we'll meet the Sundance Kid. It's all next on Main Street, Wyoming. Production funding for Main Street, Wyoming is provided in part by the Wheeler Family Foundation of Casper and by the members of Wyoming PBS. Thank you. <sighs> Welcome to Thermopolis, world famous for its mineral hot springs. Ray Schaefer will bring us a local perspective on how the town of Thermopolis developed, as well as highlight some of the many charms that attract visitors to this unique Wyoming paradise. <music> I was born and raised here in Thermopolis. I'm fourth generation native, uh, so my roots go deep, and uh, it's a good place to live. <laughs> you gotta understand how Thermopolis came about. We are the most isolated place in Wyoming. There was no access into the Bighorn Basin except from the north and coming in from the east, and that was, wasn't great. We're bounded by mountains and uh, natural topography all around us. It was difficult to get in here. The first really trail that came in here was Jim Bridger brought the uh, wagon trains, uh, came over uh, D Pass and came down Kirby Creek, crossed the river and then went north into Montana. Then later uh, we, they had the Merritt Pass, which is we call Blondie Pass today, which is up on Upper Owl Creek. And that was actually the first mail route and first stage route that came into the Bighorn Basin. The reservation had all of this country that was south of Owl Creek, but there was a little notch right at the mouth of Owl Creek where it joins the, the Bighorn River that uh, Ben Hansen took out a, a claim for a town site there. He had a, a little settlement started there, and so they had this shooting over there, and, a, and Dr. Schulke, he was the only resident doctor in the area, came over from Lander to treat the gunshot wound he had been here before and it was attracted to the hot springs. He was drawn to the area and was familiar with the area. And so the folks at the mouth of Owl Creek decided they wanted to have a post office there in their settlement. So they didn't have a name for their town. And that's when Dr. Schulke and a, a couple of old Irishmen by the name of McGill and O'Reilly, they got together and a couple of the neighbors around and, and they decided they'd name it Thermopolis because they, they would name it after the hot springs, thermal for hot or boiling, and, and uh, polis for city. So they set that as the name. That was the name of the town at, at that time. Though we were quite a ways down the river, five miles or six miles from the actual hot springs, there were people squatting here and, and coming to the hot springs all the time. The post office actually moved uh, down to the old town. We call it old town now. In, uh, 1895. The deal was around the Big Springs was all reservation. There wasn't any settlement allowed here. So I think there were probably politics involved, but anyway, they bought 10 miles square from the Indians because the game had been depleted one thing or another. And they bought it from the Indians and they got it for 90 some cents an acre. It automatically opened it up for white man settlement here. And, and in 1896, there was a town at the mouth of Owl Creek. By 97, everything had moved here and they just abandoned that town out there. They about more or less picked up the old buildings and just came this way and established a town where the deal was that the state of Wyoming would own a one mile square around the Big Springs and that would be set apart as the state reserve and the rest of that 10 mile square would be opened up to white man settlement. People automatically said, well, let's build and they did and, and built the town quickly. One of the stipulations that when uh, 
the land was bought from the Indians was Chief Woiski said that the water had to be free to use. So they, to this very day, we have the state bathhouse, which is free to use. And it's uh, water comes straight from the hot springs to that. And the Indians used it way before the white man was here. The Crow and the Shoshone and the Sioux, the Blackfeet came into this area. And, and uh, so it was used by several different tribes. And, and they'd travel here for the hunting and for the use of the water. And so it, when the white man got opportunity, opportunity to use it, well, then they naturally commercialized it. And so anything outside the free water was concessionaires came in with the plunges and the, and the hotels and things that we have today. One of the things that's really come on lately is that's adjacent to the state park is the, the Wyoming Dinosaur Center where they discovered some new dinosaurs here and, and we've got quite a display there for um, folks to come in and, and something that's turned educational, they have what they call a kid's dig over there that the young uh, school children can come here in the summer and actually dig up dinosaur bones. So it's been quite an addition to the community to find uh, those old relics here. The state buffalo herd has, has been here and I guess the state actually has two herds but this is the, uh, the official herd here it's been here all my life. And in fact, last year we celebrated the centennial of the buffalo herd and the swinging bridge uh, the same year we're established here. This area was established for agriculture purposes, uh, ranching and, and farming mostly. And that has diversified a lot through the years. But when they discovered oil here and when the train came here, it changed the country. When the, when the railroad came to Thermopolis in, in 1910, it opened up trade and uh, ways to get your product in and out of here. But probably our biggest boom years were in the 50s and the 60s. We had Empire Oil had a uh, refinery here in town and, and employed a lot of people. And the, there was mining operations still going on in the, in the 50s and, the, and into, a little into the 60s. And the oil fields were booming pretty good in those years. So. I think we probably peaked around, I would say five or 6,000 people probably in the county at that time. Tourism is a, is a pretty big business. We've just built a new airport here west of town. So we have great access for folk, folks to fly in and we're, uh, in the process of upgrading our our hospital medical facilities around here with a, a new hospital district. We've got all new schools here, so it's a, we have a lot of draw for families to move here. But the actual draw of, for most people to come here for is for the tourism to come in. And uh, once they find the place, then they want to live here. We find a lot of folks just want to move and, and stay here because it's a great place to raise a family. It's year round because that hot water, the, the plunges and the hotels are open. They cater to folks year round. A lot of the schools uh, bring their kids here for uh, field trips and that. And so it's turned into quite a tourist area. The state park has just gone through a 20 year plan uh, looking ahead. There'll be some changes in the state park. Uh, a lot of the old things will stay. The things that really draw the people are the, you know, the terraces that people like to walk and the swinging bridge and of course Monument Hill. It's not many places you see a, a hill with a sign on it. I don't know, you can go a lot of places in the country, but uh, you know, there are certain places that just strike you as a, as a good place to live. We, we're not really isolated, but we're not in the thick of things. We have one stoplight and that's plenty. Uh, kind of a spot that's out of the way with great scenery and great hunting and, and lots of uh, natural resources here to, to enjoy and so I don't know where I'd rather live anywhere else. Kind of like my dad, my granddad. They never went anywhere, just lived right here. Hello, welcome to Glenrock. Local historian Kevin Campbell will share with us a bit of the compelling history of Glenrock and how events in Glenrock have had a ripple effect across Wyoming and across the region. Glenrock, Wyoming is located in the Platte River Valley 
even though it's not well known, it's probably one of the most historic towns in the state of Wyoming. Being in the Valley of the Platte, uh, the ancient people, uh, the original Native Americans would follow the game animals through this valley and uh, so it was very prominent for campsites with all the Native people going clear back to the days of the mammoth hunters. Coming into the more modern era, which for me would be the, seven, the late 1700s, early 1800s, um, that's when the European interaction started to occur and uh, the Native American tribes here started to gather more horses and with the horses they become more mobile and better hunters and, and the Platte River Valley being the home of buffalo and elk and every animal known this was prime pristine hunting ground. As the Oregon Trail started to progress Deer Creek was a main camping ground for the pioneers. When the Mormons got here Brigham Young, they went and they caught baskets of fish out of Deer Creek. And Brigham Young declared this a heaven sent place. Plus they found bitmus coal in the banks along the Deer Creek. They uh, would mine the coal here in Glenrock for their blacksmith shop at the Mormon Ferry up in Casper. In 1851, because of the coal and the abundance of resources in the Deer Creek Valley, they started to build a supply station in 1855, Thomas Twist was the Indian agent at Fort Laramie. He had hired Joseph Bissonette as an interpreter. He came in in 1856 and established a trade station on the trail. Bissonette's trading post was used as a home station uh, when the Pony Express came through. Well, in 1861, when the telegraph station came through, they built the first telegraph station there. And so in 1862, the military was sent in here, and it was the 11th Ohio Cavalry. They built Deer Creek Station around the telegraph station with Bissonette's trading posts across the road from it. There are many, many Oregon Trail diaries that mention Deer Creek Station, and along the way they talk about the hardships, because at the time they wanted to get cooking, so they would unload everything that wasn't necessary, and the trail was said to be littered with cast off items. The Oregon Trail was rough coming through here. There are more known graves along the Pioneer Trails in Converse County, Wyoming, than in any other county in any other state um, along the trail system. In the 1880s, is when Glenrock actually came to be. The Missouri Fremont Elkhorn Railroad was coming north. And of course, anytime there's a railroad going, that's big business. So uh, there would be mining camps. And the first mining camp they called Mercedes. In 1885, William Nuttall came in here to Mercedes and started another camp because he's the one that started the actual real modern mining in Box Elder Canyon. They named the town Nuttall after him. And it was at that same time that John Higgins, who built the building that we're in right now, he came to the Deer Creek Valley in 1885. The railroad had reached Douglas in 1886, and in 1887 it came to Glenrock. And where the Rock and the Glen is, west of town, is where the original railroad depot, that was the end of the line. The people decided, well, we're gonna have a regular post office. We need to have an official town name. And so they decided on Glenrock for the rock, the rock in the Glen, Glenrock. With the railroad depot being right across from it, John Higgins started to build uh, different mercantile businesses. And of course, as a township, it built and the town of Glenrock came to be. Glenrock was just a rail town, you know, and a cattle town. Coal, you know, they had the coal mines. Well, in 1913, that all changed. In 1913, they discovered oil in the big muddy anticline. 1916, Merritt Oil drilled the first real well out in the big muddy oil field. At that time, the Big Muddy oil field was one of the largest oil fields in the continental United States. With the energy boom coming, you know how Wyoming is with booms, 
John Higgins decided that he was going to build an establishment for his wife. And so in 1916, he built the Higgins Hotel. Josephine died in 1924, and uh, it really screwed John up. He died two years later. They never had any children, so it was kind of a quandary. He bequeathed his entire estate of about $500,000. And so when he bequeathed this to the state of Wyoming, John owned oil wells out in the big muddy oil field. And so those oil wells directly funded the University of Wyoming in the 1920s. In the late 60s, early 70s, they started mining, pit mining for uranium. Well, along with coal and uranium in 1967, they built the Dave Johnson power plant east of town. And the Dave Johnson plant at that time had its own coal mine, its own railroad. Uh, it was a huge employer. Glenrock had always been part of the game trail, you know, part of the Indians movements, the Oregon Trail, the Pony Express, everything followed Highway 2026. Well, in the 1970s, when I-25 came, it, it was built a mile south of town. And so that really impacted Glenrock because when the interstate came through, Glenrock just didn't have the traffic that they once did. Well, then they got hit with the 80s. Coal mining stopped, oil field was down, uranium was at a very low point to where Glenrock just to darn near died, you know, I think it shares that story with a lot of little towns. But with Casper being one of the largest hubs in central Wyoming, Glenrock kind of redeveloped itself as a bedroom community. If, if a person was to come to Glenrock today, there's a lot of different things that Glenrock has to offer. We have the Deer Creek History Museum, which is just on the west end of town. In 1994, they found Stephanie Triceratops. It was a very good specimen. And as they went on, they found more and more dinosaurs. And right across the street from us here is the Glenrock Paleon Museum. During the summer months, we also have the Valentine Speedway. And if you get up into Box Elder Canyon, probably one of Glen Rock's best kept secrets. In 1920, the county, Congress County, appealed to Congress wanting to uh, take possession of this canyon for its natural beauty. They compared it with the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon itself for its beauty. Congress authorized that and uh, Converse County Park is what it's called now, but that's Box Elder Canyon. There's not a, any event that you can say defines Glenrock, but Glenrock's connected to so much of Wyoming's history, almost like a spider web. The events that happened in Glenrock, Wyoming are like a ripple in time because the impact happened in Glenrock, but the ripple went out and affected far and wide. There are many, many different occurrences where what happened in Glenrock affected the history of so many places. Oh, hello, welcome to Sundance. This fella here is named Harry Longbow, but you might know him better as the Sundance Kid. Before he joined up with Butch Cassidy and his Wild Bunch, Harry had his first run-ins with the law right here in Sundance. Rocky Kershane will tell us about the kid, some history of the area, and how Sundance got its name. But first, Ivan Posey will tell us about the Native American ritual of the Sundance. We talked about the town of Sundance and how it got its name, and, but I think the name of the ceremony in general is pretty sacred to many tribes yet. So it's actually a very strong religious ceremony for us. The origin changes from tribe to tribe. They got different stories. Some feel that that story came from this gentleman walking and he came across a buffalo skull. And he looked inside that buffalo skull and had a vision and, 
and seeing how this dance was going to be performed. I know, but most of them are pretty similar of how this, this came to be. You know, it's, it's a ceremony that uh, uh, reflects uh, good health and I guess uh, something that keeps indigenous people stronger throughout the years. Some may have a, a lodge, build a lodge where only 12 or 15 people go in. Some have 100 dancers in there. You know, it just depends on who sponsors it and how they go about it. What I know, because I have participated in a few, at least on the Wind River, we do not pierce. Northern Cheyenne and some tribes in South Dakota still do the piercing yet, where they pierce themselves and leave scars, and some drag um, buffalo skulls around. Here we just fast for three days and three nights. The dancers that participate in it, they welcome in the sunrise. Uh, they dance, they dance hard, even though they're thirsty and hungry. And, uh, and at the end of the, the ceremony, then they um, go eat, have, have a feast, basically. A lot of tribal people participate and, and go up to the Sundance grounds and some camp there. And, and like I said, it's a, it's a means of healing. It's a means of um, getting more strength for your tribe and something that has been around for a long, long, long time. You know, it's, it's very uh, powerful to, to be in the presence of that ceremony. The name Sundance is from the Native American ritual. As legend goes, they did it at the base of Sundance Mountain, and the early settlers saw them in the early 1870s. They were, there was a lot of mining to the north of us, and there were miners and settlers up there, and they saw these ceremonies going on down below, and they called it the Sundance and Sundance Mountain. This whole area was very sacred to them. They said that they took care of the buffalo and they kept them in the valleys where the green grass was, almost like a, you know cattle herds. And the top of the hills like Green Mountain, Indian Cara, and Sundance Mountain were lookouts. So they could sit up there and watch the whole valleys and looking for you know other aggressive tribes coming in. Or... Sundance was a draw because of the gold. Deadwood was starting to do the big gold rush. We had gold mines to the north of us in the Bear Lodge Mountains. And then when Albert Hoag established a ranch in 1875, he found there was a lot of freight wagons coming through, going to Deadwood in 1876, and decided he was gonna build a trading post down by the creek. And there were more and more people kept coming in, um, wanting to buy property from Albert Hoag, wanting to put a saloon in, wanting to put a restaurant in. Uh, cafes and he decided to start selling pieces of his ranch off and they ended up calling the town Sundance after the mountain. From the very beginning when he wrote up the plans Sundance was going to be the county seat. We were still Dakota territory at this time and he knew what he wanted and it happened for him. We were incorporated in 1887. He designed the streets so 12 horse teams could turn around in from Holland Freight so they're extra wide now today we use them for horse trailers and RVs to park in the middle. The gold and the logging industry is what really got Sundance going. Back in the 1880s we had three four mercantiles, we had six saloons, we had you know five churches and uh, we're trying to get that back again. Being off Interstate 90 really helps to, to keep town going. The Black Hills are a huge draw for us and the Devil's Tower of course that will be our draw, will be the tourism. It's always been a main thoroughfare to the Black Hills. It was also used by the migration of the buffalo, by the migration of the elk. They all came through this valley, and so along with them came the Native Americans. We knew him as Harry Longbow. He was a hired hand that worked on ranches throughout the area. He was originally from Pennsylvania. He came out west and settled with his uncle down in Cortez, Colorado. From there, when he got old enough, he started working on ranch and being a ranch hand throughout Colorado and Wyoming and Montana. Started working at the 3V Ranch north of town here, about 30 miles. And in the fall, the rancher didn't need him anymore, so he re released him and he ended up taking a horse and a gun and a saddle with him. So we have the indictment papers for him. In, in our archival area. He was 17 years old at the time he was here, so he was still a kid. When Sheriff Ryan went to look for him, they, the telegraph came out and he said, yeah, Harry Longbow is up in Mile City, Montana. 
So our sheriff ran up there and got him. And then the Sheriff Ryan does another strange little thing. With Harry Longbow in custody, he decided to go check on some cattle business in St. Paul. Around Duluth, the kid escapes. Sheriff Ryan uh, wrote a letter to the Sundance Times uh, telling his story, saying, I ended up taking Harry Longbow with me to check on some cattle business, and he escaped. I'm sorry. <laughs> So when he got back to Sundance a couple of weeks later, there was another telegraph going, Harry's still in Miles City, what's going on? So that little timeline is a little odd for us because we really don't know if Ryan was telling the truth or not. You know, did he not see him up there? Did he not find him? We, we don't know. And how did he escape? He was supposedly shackled to the seat. From there, uh, he went up and got him again. This time, put him on a stagecoach, brought him back to Sundance found him guilty of grand larceny for stealing a horse and a gun, got sentenced for 18 months. During those 18 months, he tried to escape twice. He pulled the pins out of the door once and he hit the deputy over the head the other time. Both times he was caught, they brought him back and about two weeks before his sentence was up, our Justice of the Peace contacted the governor and said, you know, we got Harry Longbound here. I was wondering if we could let him go on early release on good behavior even though he tried to escape twice. <laughs> and the governor said, sure, we can do that. They did that a lot back then, a, you know, a lot of early releases. And, you know, and like I said, the kid had to have been a smooth talker. He, he, he had him under his thumb. He, he knew what he could do and couldn't do. So when he left, he had a clean record, and he was known as Harry Longabout until he hooked up with the Wild Bunch. And they started robbing the banks and trains. And since he was sentenced here for 18 months as a kid, they called him the Sundance Kid. The city of Sundance has uh, embraced it very well. The townspeople are having trouble with us, you know, having a statue of the Sundance Kid, but he is such a big draw, and they see how many people sit on the bench next to the Sundance Kid and get their photo taken, and they're finally accepting that, you know, we're not immoralizing him, we are using him as a draw for my tourist. With everything that's been going on in the last, you know, couple years of how tourism has really come to the main point for Sundance, um, they're realizing that, you know, the kid is our draw and we've got to use him. You can still see remnants of the old town, the wide streets. You can go out up in the hills and in the, in the prairies and still see the remnants of the Native Americans. You know, the, the stone rings you can find, the artifacts you can find. Well, even when you walk at night in town, the smell of the pine trees come down. Walk downtown and they say it's, it feels different here. You know, you can feel the history just a unique area. We're nestled in between two mountains, um, beautiful little downtown area, cool summer nights, uh, just a, a beautiful, beautiful area. And you kind of feel why we're here and why the Native Americans were here. And it just, uh, it's, you, can, you can touch it, you can, you can feel it, you can smell it. It's, it's all pretty cool. We hope you've enjoyed this What's in a Name edition of Main Street, Wyoming. If there are other unique names in Wyoming you'd like to see explored, or have other ideas for Main Street, please send us an email at MainStreetWyoming at wyomingpbs.org. Thank you. Production funding for Main Street, Wyoming is provided in part by the Wheeler Family Foundation of Casper and by the members of Wyoming PBS. Thank you.